This time it's five underrated motorcycles, part two. It seems that the motorcycle industry, there are some bikes that get all the love if you like. There are many other underrated motorcycles that are just as good that don't seem to get quite the attention that others do. So you have five more motorcycles and deserving of perhaps a little bit more love. The Honda CBR 650R. Honda CBR 650R is a development of the earlier CBR 600F and of course the Hornet that came before it. And it is what Honda do very well. It's a good all round road machine and not one that's actually designed for the track. Now most people in days gone by when plumbing for a machine of this kind of size for the road would tend to go for the R6. The R6 is a very fine and very handsome machine but it's really not a great road bike. It's far too extreme to be enjoyable particularly in dodgy conditions. And while a lot of people will say yes but it's not designed for use on the road it's a track bike I would counter this by saying actually Yamaha did fit lights and indicators the thing. The CBR650 by comparison is, well it's softer. It has a much better mid-range, it doesn't have the top end rush of course, but it's more comfortable over fairly typical roads. And that is of course fairly bumpy. The brakes and everything about the bike just suggest user friendliness. The riding position is fairly comfortable. Although this is no cruiser bike, it's certainly a big improvement over a pucker sports bike. Pegs are a little high, but not too high, and the bars equally are fairly low, but again, not as low as on a proper all-out sports bike. I have found that riding over some distance, they can get a little bit wristy, however. Another downside to the bike is the engine. Not that it's underpowered, 94 horsepower is a perfectly reasonable horsepower figure, I think, for a bike that's going to be used for general road use. But it can be a little bit buzzy at certain points in its RPM range. In top gear this tends to happen somewhere just over 80 miles an hour. And it's not terrible, but it is slightly disappointing in an otherwise very refined package. The other area that lets the bike down is the LCD screen. It gives reasonable information, but under bright sunlight it can be a little bit difficult to read. But overall this is a really good bike, and it's also one that can be restricted to A2 category, which not too many four-cylinder bikes can these days. And in terms of middleweight four-cylinder sports bikes, it's very much now the last man standing. Let's hope it runs on for a few more years, but with the introduction of the new twin cylinder Hornet, it seems like its days may well be numbered. Yamaha's Tenere 1200. Yamaha have a long and glorious history of producing great off-road machines. And in fact, they were winning the Paris Dakar long before BMW even conceived the idea of the GS. Don't tell that to BMW fans, but it's true. The Super Tenere arrived in 2010. It featured a parallel twin engine which had a 270 degree crank, so it sounds a little bit like a Ducati or a typical 90 degree V twin when it's in use. It's water cooled four valves per cylinder and fuel injection, of course, and makes about 108 horsepower. It's also shaft drive, a feature which is sadly in decline in machines of its type these days. This is fed through by a six-speed gearbox, which works very well. The bike, of course, features all-round disc brakes, with traction control and ABS as standard. And to me, it's a very handsome machine, very purposeful and much better looking than, say, a GS or any of the equivalents that were around at that time. But despite excellent manners both on and off-road, and Yamaha's by now extremely good build quality, the bike never really sold in the numbers Yamaha were expecting. The reasons for this can simply be described in three letters, BMW. The GS has always been more popular. Whether it's a better bike is of course open for debate, but the fact is the BMW took away a lot of the sales from bikes of this nature. The Yamaha makes a really great alternative. It's got an excellent fuel range thanks to that 24 litre tank and is all round a very capable machine. Downsides, I would say, the fact that it's pretty tall with a low seat height of 845 going up to 870 when it's at its full range. The other major downside, both then and now, is the fact that it's a rather heavy bike with a wet weight of 261 kilos or 575 pounds. 
Some people also thought that the LCD display was rather crude and outdated, but I think it gives the bike a kind of unique character. Not everybody in this world wants a pucker, full colour TFT. They just want something that works and looks rugged. And that I think is what this bike really does well. So if you are out there looking for a second hand big adventure bike, don't necessarily focus just on BMW. Great bikes that they are, there are alternatives out there. And this is a very, very good one. The Suzuki GSF 600 Bandit. When first conceived back in 1989, Suzuki's Bandit didn't seem like a great prospect. After all, all they'd done was taken the air oil cooled engine from their somewhat outdated GSX F600 model and shoved it into a steel tubular frame. They'd also stuck on fairly cheap suspension and fairly cheap brakes to create a budget motorcycle. But in fact what they'd done was create a whole new category of motorcycle. And these machines would go on to dominate the marketplace for several years, way into the new millennium. OK, so the bike only had 80 horsepower and a top speed of around 125 miles an hour. And on the naked versions in particular, that was more than enough. It already had you hanging on like a human parachute if you opened the thing up. But that's not to say the bike didn't work pretty well when you were touring over long distances. The ergos were good, it was comfortable. Some had the egg-shaped casings on the front of the clocks, managed to divert some of the wind, at least, away from your chest, so it wasn't quite as uncomfortable as you might expect. And so what if the brake performance was only average, and the front forks tended to dive because they were too soft at the front when you braked heavily? This was a machine that is more than the sum of its parts. Performance is adequate, but it's also extremely enjoyable. That engine has a real character to it, which most modern bikes simply didn't have, even at the time. Its air oil called nature meant that it was that little bit more mechanically noisy, so it gave a little bit more feel than, say, a water-cooled engine did. The gearbox and the clutch was all light and easy to use. The sitting position was very comfortable and you could ride it all day, no problem at all. Especially the bikes with the half-screen, they were really great tourers. But the most important thing was the way it handled. Despite all those cheap cycle parts and the fairly rudimentary chassis, the bike steered fantastically. It's one of those bikes where you simply looked where you wanted to go and it went there. Of course, more exotic bikes came into challenge its throne as time went by. Machines like the Phaser and the Hornet were more powerful, but for me somehow, they lacked that little bit of character. I'm saying this as a previous Bandit owner and also somebody who owned a Phaser too. The Phaser was faster, but somehow less involving. Humble it may have been, but the Bandit is a truly brilliant motorcycle and is one of the most enjoyable bikes to ride that I've ever owned. An absolute gem of a motorcycle. Kawasaki's W800 model. Kawasaki's W800 is the classically styled modern bike that people generally seem to forget about. Most people talk about the Bonneville and quite often people also talk about the Royal Enfield, but not so much the W650 and its later 800, but it has a classic lineage all of its very own. The story starts with Kawasaki's very first big four-stroke. This was the W500, which Kawasaki acquired in the late 60s when they took over another Japanese company. The machine was in fact a BSA A7 built under license. The modern machine is of course very different from its A7 base forebear. The engine may look fairly similar and indeed does have a 360 degree crank, so both pistons rise and fall, just like on a traditional British bike. So if you're looking for something that behaves like a traditional British bike, this is really the bike for you. Without a doubt, the most unusual feature of the bike is the fact that it uses a drive shaft and bevel gears to power the camshafts, just like the old Norton Inter used to. This then powers a single overhead camshaft, fitting four valves per cylinder. The engine only makes about 47 horsepower, which is one of the reasons it's perhaps a little bit less popular than some of its competition, particularly the Triumphs. So that 360 crank can of course generate more vibration than the cranks used on some of its opposition. 
Kawasaki fitted a balance shaft to the front of the engine and this does smooth out the majority of the vibes. There is still some there but it's not enough to take away from the riding experience and in fact it gives the bike that slightly classic feel that some of the other machines simply don't have. So should you be in the market for a retro bike the W800 may be a very good choice. The Triumph TT600 When you look back at the TT600 you think this is possibly a bike that may have been cursed at some point. First there was early mechanical problems and then a whacking great big fire at the factory halted all production of the bike. But even before the fire the TT600 could only really be described as a failure. For this was Triumph at Hinkley's first attempt to really take the Japanese market head on because the 600 market was massive at that time and it is perhaps Triumph's huge ambition for the bike which actually did for it because this was the first bike in its class to feature electronic fuel injection and as Triumph found to their cost trying to get the mapping just right on a high revving sports bike is rather more difficult than it first appeared. When the bike was first tried out by the press it was run round a track and to be honest the shortcomings weren't noticed at all because they were in the higher part of the rev range but it was at the lower and mid part of the rev range where the bike simply didn't fuel very well at all particularly low down it tended to hunt and was very flat to their credit Triumph did move quickly to resolve the problems they introduced remaps which at least in part got rid of some of the flat spots and made the bike run a little bit better at least low down but by then the damage to the bike's reputation was done and despite having a fantastic chassis with great handling and wonderful brakes the bike was never a great seller many people thought the styling somewhat dull I personally quite like it particularly the blue model I had which I thought was very pretty but if you're buying one today that lack of popularity means that prices are generally pretty low so it can be a real steal if you're wanting a nice sporty bike from the early 2000s the well I do hope you enjoyed our selection of five slightly more modern this time underrated motorcycles what bikes do you think are underrated particularly in the more modern era why not comment below and if you enjoyed that video don't forget to like and subscribe and of course thank you very much for watching